Hello students, I welcome you all to lecture number three, poem number one, The Road Not Taken of class nine. The book is Behind. So class, in this chapter, we will discuss the poem written by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Before we start this poem, I want all of you to open your textbooks. Uh, though I have written this danger here for your convenience, still, you should open your books. Now, here, we will know something about the poet Robert Frost. Robert Frost was a 19th century American poet. He was born in 1874. The present poem has been taken from one of his collections of poems, Mountain Interval. This collection of poems entitled this Mountain Interval was published in 1916. So this, The Road Not Taken, was the first poem from this collection of poems. The Road Not Taken, the theme of this poem is making choices. Making choices Students, as we know, that sometimes there are many situations in life that we have alternatives before us. And we have to make the decision. Out of the many choices, options, and alternatives, uh, alternatives available, we have to choose one. We have to choose the one which is the best for us. But are we always so intelligent to make the right choice? No. And uh, it is not in the present that we can know whether the choice that we have made is good or bad for us. It is only the future that will tell us whether the choice that we have made has borne a good outcome. So the theme of this poem is making choices. and. Any decision that we make in a life has a greater significance on the course of our future. So there can be the two themes of this poem, The Road Not Taken. Points to be discussed in this lecture number three, where we are going to discuss the poem number one, The Road Not Taken. In this uh, poem, we are going to discuss these five points. We'll discuss the theme that I have just told you about. Second, uh, there is the rhyme scheme. What is the rhyme scheme of each stanza? Poetic devices. I'll tell you what poetic devices are and how we can find them, trace them in the given stanza. Then there is the narrative, uh, sorry, the nature of this poem. The nature of this poem is that this poem is a narrative. A narrative poem is a poem that seems to narrate something. I'll tell you how this poem falls in the category of narrative poem. Then there is type. What is the type of this poem? The type of this poem that this is, this poem is a quintet. What is a quintet? A quintet is a poem uh, whose each stanza is consisted of five lines. We have uh, a stanza of two lines, we call it a couplet. A stanza of three lines, we call it a tacit. And uh, a stanza of four lines is called a uh, quatrain. Q U A T R A I N quatrain. And a stanza of five lines is called a quintet. Q U I N T E T. So, all these things we will discuss in this poem, number one, The Road Not Taken. 
Students, uh, I have written the stanza here. We will read uh, from line to line and I will try to explain what message does each line convey. So, let's get ready. So students, I am going to explain stanza number one of this poem. I'm going to read from line to line so that I can help you understand it well. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. In the first line of this stanza, we come to know that the poet Robert Frost is perhaps standing at such a cross road where he finds that the road he was walking on all of a sudden is a split into two and the, both the roads are leading to a forest. To a forest where? To where it bent in the undergrowth. Undergrowth word means Undergrowth means bush. A mass of stalks, grass, bush, bush. Undergrowth here also means the unknown world. The two roads were leading to the undergrowth of the forest. Very thick part of the forest where there are a lot of trees. Where there, are, where there is a lot of grass. So the two roads were leading to the forest and which part of the forest? To the undergrowth. Undergrowth which is an unknown world to the poet. So two roads diverged in a yellow wood. The word diverged means dividing into two parts or turning into different directions. And sorry, I cannot travel both. In the second line of this stanza, the poet feels sorry. Why does he feel sorry? He feels sorry because he is unable to travel both the roads at the same time. He wants to walk on the, both the roads at the same time, but he is unable to do so, and that is why he feels sorry. Let us move on to line number three, students. And be one traveler, long I stood. The poet says, since he was the only traveler and there were two roads before him, he kept standing for a long time. Why was he standing for a long time? Because he was thinking which road he should take. He was thinking which road is the best one for him. That is why he was standing over there and he was thinking. He was lost in deep thoughts. He wanted to make the right decision. And we went traveler long as stood. And looked down one as far as I could. From time to time he was looking at first at the one road, first road and then at the second road. He was examining both the roads. He was trying to understand which road he should take and why. So he looked down one as far as I, uh, he could. As far as his eyes could see, he was looking at both the roads to where it went in the undergrowth. Both the roads were leading the traveler to the undergrowth. So students, in stanza number one, we come to know that the poet is standing at such a place where a road is splitting into two and leading to two different directions. The poet is now puzzled is in confusion, is in dilemma with which road he should take and is unable to make the right choice. And he knows that this is a very crucial point, this is a very decisive moment because he, he knows that the choice he makes here will change the course of his future. That is why uh, he says that uh, he said that long I stood. Long I stood here means that he was standing for a long time. So students, here the stanza number one ends. So students, one more thing that we should take in our consideration is the rhyme scheme of this stanza. Here I've written that we are going to discuss the rhyme scheme of each stanza. 
Uh, the rhyme scheme of this astenia is rhyme. What is the rhyme? Rhyme is the repetition of similar sounding words at the end of a verse line. What is rhyme? The repetition of the similar sounding words at the end of each verse line. This is the verse line. What is the ending word of this line? This ending word of this line is which. And what is the ending word of this verse line? Both. What is the ending word of this verse line? Stood. And what is the ending word of this verse line? Could. And what is the ending word of this verse line? Undergrowth. So these are the ending words of each verse line. Now let us try to understand the sound. Wood is entirely a different sound. Or this is the first sound. We have not made any comparison yet with any other words. Whether the other words are creating the same sound as this. Word number two, both. Wood and both. Both are different sounds. We have given this symbol A. We will give this symbol B. Then, stood. Stood is the similar sound as the wood. As uh, the word wood. So, we will give this A symbol. Wood, stood and could. Both are similar sounding words. Again, A. So, A, B, A, A. And this last undergrowth rhymes with the word both. Undergrowth, both. Undergrowth, both. So, what is the symbol that we have given to both? B. We will give this to B. So, this becomes the rhyme scheme of the sustainer. What is the rhyme scheme? The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, A, B, A, A and B. A, B, A, A, B is the rhyme scheme of this stanger. Understood? A poetic device. There is poetic device in the first line of this stanger. We will discuss it, it at the end. So students, uh, we are moving on to the explanation of the stanger number two. I have written the stanger for your convenience here. Uh, let me read the line number one. The line number one says, then took the other just as fair. So in line number one, we come to know that the poet Robert Frost has made his choice. He has made the decision. And the decision is that he has chosen the second road. Other here means the second road out of the two roads. So he has chosen the other road over the first one. So in line number one, we come to know that he has made his decision. Now, and having perhaps a better claim, Poet believes this, that his decision to choose the road number two, the other road, uh, actually students, we cannot tell which road is the first one and which road is the other one. Suppose this is road number one, this is road number two, and this is the poet standing. Now the poet, we cannot say, we cannot give uh, the order of the roads. Maybe this is the first one, or maybe this is the second one, or the vice versa. So the poet has chosen the second road over the first one. And he says that his choice is the best choice. He, he says that the road he has chosen deserves to be chosen. This has the better claim. Claim here means deserve. The road deserves to be chosen. Because it was grassy and wanted wear. So in line number three, we come to know uh, that poet gives us the reason for his choosing the road number two. He says because it was grassy and wanted wear. So, uh, students, uh, the actual, apart from the actual meaning that the line conveys, there is a hidden meaning also. And we must know this hidden meaning as well. So, the poet, in the, from this line, we come to know about the nature of the poet. What is the nature of the poet? Uh, we believe that the poet is a very, very courageous person. He wants to take the risks. And... Uh, what is the risk? The road was grassy. That simply means nobody walked on the road. Till the moment he was there. And wanted where? This road wanted where? When wanted where means the road wanted someone to walk on it. Though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. So here 
the poet says that he chooses the road number two because it was grassy. Because nobody had chosen this road. And he wants to make the decision. He wants to choose something that nobody has chosen. Uh, it is in the last two lines of the sustainer, we come to know that the poet has a contradiction. In the first, uh, in, in the second, uh, in the third line of the sustainer number two, the poet said that it was grassy and wanted way. That is why he chose the other road. He chose the other road because it was grassy. But it is in the last two lines of the sustainer, the poet says that both the roads, that both the roads were equally worn were equally worn. Though it's for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. He wants to say that the both the roads were travelled by equally or both the roads were walked on by the people equally. Let us now move on to the explanation of stanger number three. But before we move on to the explanation of stanger number three, let us again Come to know the rhyme scheme of this stanza. Here, fair, A, claim, B, where. Rhymes with fair, again, A, there. Rhymes with where, as well as to fair. A, and then same. Rhymes with claim, B. So again, the rhyme scheme of this stanza is Similar to the rhyme scheme of the stanza number 1. A, B, A, A, B. Let us now move on to the explanation of stanza number 3. Let us read the stanza number 3 and try to understand what the poet wants to say. And both that morning equally lay, as in the last two lines of the stanza number 2, we came to know that the poet said that both the roads had been worn out by the people equally. Similarly, he says that and both that morning equally means it was the time of morning when the poet was standing at that first road. And he saw that the both uh, the roads looked exactly the same. In leaves no step had trodden black. Trodden is the past participle of the word trad to walk. Trodden. In leaves no step had trodden black means the leaves on the road were intact. Nobody had even touched them. So it was a sign that nobody had walked on that road. In Lee's no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. The poet uh, who has already made his decision. He has chosen the road number two. So he here now says that, oh, I kept the first for another day. Means he is leaving the first road for another day. He, being one traveler, he cannot travel both the roads at the same time. Similarly, he cannot choose two options at the same time. Yet knowing how way leads on the way, I doubt it if I ever should come back. The poet says, the poet is aware of the fact that one way leads to another. How way leads, how way leads on the way. The poet knows very well that one way leads to another and that is why he is doubtful whether he will ever be able to come back and take the first road. And take the first road. He just doubts. Will he ever be able to take the first road? Means, when we have few options before us and we take the first option, this will change the course of our future and we will never ever have that uh, we will never ever have such a situation that we can choose the next option, right? Similarly, the poet says that uh, if he chooses this way, he this way will lead him somewhere in future. And perhaps he will never be able to come back and take this road. Which road? The first one. So, we have understood this is Tenja. Now, again, the rhyme scheme. Lay. We give it A symbol. Black, different sound, B symbol, day, again similar to word lay, A sound, uh, A symbol, then way, similar to day, as well as to lay, A sound, uh, sorry, A symbol, and then back. Rhymes with black, B sound. The rhyme, is, rhyme scheme is the same, A, B, A, A, B. Let us now move on to 
stage number four. So students, we are moving on to the stanza number four, the last stanza of this poem. And this is the conclusion here that the poet draws. The poet says, I shall be telling this with a sigh. What is that that poet will tell this? What is this? This is the choice that the poet made in the past. So I shall be telling about the choice I made with a sigh. Sigh. This can either be the sigh of relief or the sigh of pain. He is unaware of the fruit of the decision that he has made. It is only the future that will tell him what kind of fruit the choice he made has wrought or has taken out. Now. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hands. To whom will he be telling? It is just an assumption that he will be telling this to either his friends, either to his relatives or the young people of his, uh, of his old age or to his grandchildren. So he will be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hands. Ages and ages hands means after a long period of time, he will be telling this to someone. What will he tell? Two roads diverge in a verge, and I. He wants to say that once upon a time there was a, once upon a time he was standing somewhere and he saw the two roads were split into two directions, and that he was unable to make the right decision, and he took the one less traveled by, and he chose the one the road which was traveled by less people less number of people so because of the choice that he made in the past that has made all the difference what kind of difference is the poet talking about the difference is what the poet is today whatever the poet is today it is because of the choice that he made in the past and what was the choice the choice was that he chose the second road over the first one simply the poet wants to say that if whatever, uh, let me just uh, take an instance of myself, whatever I am today, I am a teacher, I am teaching you. And uh, uh, this is just an outcome of a decision that I make in the, that I made in the past. Uh, when I was a student like you, I decided that I would become a teacher. I started making efforts and today you can see that I am a teacher. So I am a teacher because I made the decision long time ago in the past. Similarly, the poet wants to say then that has made all the difference. What is the poet now? The poet is a, the poet is a poet now. The, uh, the person, the speaker is a poet now, and he wants to say that he is a poet or whatever he is. It is because of the decision he made in the past. So, students, here we come to know that any decision that we make has a greater significance in our life. It has very. Uh, it creates a very significant impact on the future. So, whenever we have a choice to make, we must think about it a lot. And we must make the rational decision which uh, choice we should take. So, uh, students, here this poem ends. It is a very good poem. Now, let us, we, uh, now let us discuss the poetic devices. Students, in the last section of this uh, poem, we are coming over to poetic devices. Poetic devices. Poetic device is a way of using a language by a poet in which he uses words or phrases to decorate his thoughts. Here the first poetic device used in the poem is assonance. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sound in the words of a verse line. Here the first uh, in the first stanza, the first line of the poem, two roads diverge in a yellow word. Here, the word roads and yellow. Here, the O sound is repeated. Two roads, roads in a yellow word. Yellow, O, Ro, yellow, O, Ro, yellow, O, O. O sound is repeated. Hence, it is the use of assonance. There is one more poetic device that is called repetition. In repetition, the consonant sound is repeated. 
but in assonance only vo uh, vowel sound is repeated. Now, the second poetic device is personification. Personification means when non-humans are given the human qualities. When non-humans are given the human qualities. For example, in this poem, the example is, it was grassy and wanted wear. It stands for the road and wanted is a quality. Wanted, uh, want is a quality related to human beings. Humans want, not the roads want. So here this wanting, that is the quality of human beings, is applied to the trees. It is a non-human. Hence, it is the example of personification. The sun smiled and shone bright. The sun smiled and shone bright. Here, smile is a word that is used for sun. Sun is not a human still. Smile is a quality of human beings which is applied to sun. It is also an example of personification. Apart from this, there are personal pronouns. When these personal pronouns are used for non-humanly things, uh, we say that this is personification. Uh, we will read about them in the next poems uh, in detail. Symbol. Symbol here means it tells more than the literal meaning of the word. Here, the word road stand for choices. So, this literal meaning of the word road is a road, uh, uh, a path on which people walk. But this, uh, apart from the literal meaning of the word road, we come to know this this. Uh, has a very deep meaning and this meaning is the choices. Hence it is an example of symbol. Symbolism, this is called, so entire poem is uh, a fine example of symbolism. So uh, students, we have covered theme, rhyme scheme, poetic devices. I've told you the nature of the poem. This is a narrative and the type of the poem. This is a quintet. So uh, we have covered this entire poem today in this lecture number three. I hope you have understood it well and you will be able to solve the question answers as well. So students, this lecture ends here. Thank you.